Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Allie Armstrong. I'm a field marketing specialist for Axonics Therapy and will be moderating this webinar. This evening, Dr. Mazzani will be speaking about bladder dysfunction, the common symptoms patients experience, and treatment options that may help you regain control. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Mazzani. Hi, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to have you guys join us. It's hard when I can't see you. I'm Lambda Mazzani. Many of you may be my patients already or a patient within the practice of George Urology or someone just joining us afresh. So welcome to everybody. And we appreciate you taking your time to hear more about treatment options for your bowel and bladder control. Um, it's not a topic that everybody likes to discuss. This is a nice setting because no one can see who's on here and you'll get a lot of information uh, and then hopefully we'll have the tools and next steps to seek some treatment help. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am in the Decatur office of Georgia Urology and um, actually grew up in Atlanta, um, born and raised. I left for undergraduate um, medical school and residency and then came back to practice in the same area where I grew up, um, which is Decatur. And specifically the East Lake areas where I grew up. Um, I have two kids and they went to my elementary school and are now at my high school. So I'm kind of just doing the same thing with them, but I love the community. Um, I love giving back to where I grew up. So that's why I'm back uh, with Georgia Urology in Decatur. My main hospital is DeKalb Medical Center, which is now Emory Decatur. Um, but we're a private practice group with offices all over town. So um, if you're not near Decatur, um, listen to what we have to say, and then we can always offer providers in your area as well. So if you want to learn more about me, I'm on the website for Georgia Urology. Um, and again, my main office is in Decatur. There are a couple of safety information, which I'm actually just going to delve into when we talk about the different types of therapy. Um, but there are two different types of advanced therapies we're going to talk about for both bladder and bowel incontinence, as well as for um, if you have stress incontinence versus urge incontinence. So there's different indications for each. This slide tells you about the indications, but I'm going to go through all of that in the following slides. Uh, contraindications, are, again, are patient specific. So we would talk more about that in the office. And uh, again, the warnings are based on the contraindications. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, of course, everybody should be trained before they start doing procedures. That's one of the precautions. Um, so the good news is with the referral sites at the end, we're able to refer you to the providers that are trained to do both the Axonics SNM system as well as Bulkamid. Um, and then adverse effects we'll talk about with each treatment. So let's get right to it. Uh, bladder and bowel symptoms can disrupt your life, clearly. Um, it can limit where you go, when you go places. Can you go on a trip? Can you go on an airplane? Do, are you limiting the amount of fluids you're drinking, which can affect kidney function? Uh, I don't want to go to the movies. I don't want to go to the theater. I can't make it through my sporting event uh, without leaking. And they, these are quality of life issues that are significant. Um, and so they should be addressed. You shouldn't feel limited in, in what you can do. And you're not alone. There are about 160 people signed up, I think. And the, there's many webinars. And this is just through some of our contacts through Decatur. Um, and in, in general, there's about 50 million people just in the US experiencing overactive bladder. So that's one of the first questions I have when people come in. Like, am I the only one? But we have uh, about 10 medicines and five procedures uh, to treat different types of incontinence, which just shows you how prevalent it is. Um, there's about 20 million people suffering from fecal incontinence, which is actually even less talked about than urinary incontinence. You don't see those ads on TV very often where at least we're starting the conversation more seeing ads about 
uh, people being controlled by their bladders. Um, but it is a common problem. And unfortunately, only half of patients with symptoms seek treatment, um, whether severe or not, only half of them seek treatment because people seem to accept it as a part of either aging, which is not necessarily true, or just a fact uh, that they have to deal with and not understanding that we can help. So uh, everybody wants to know why me, why am I having this? Um, and there are several factors that go into that. And that's why it's important to not self-diagnose and just give up and say, well, this is how it is. There are some things we can do um, that, that address your specific reasons for either overactive bladder, stress incontinence, or bowel incontinence. Um, and those are the three things I just mentioned. Um, as well as urinary retention, which is another, another indication for the neuromodulation. So there's overactive bladder, which is sudden urges to urinate and unable to hold or control it. There's urinary retention where you can't empty the bladder completely. And some of those symptoms overlap. I have a lot of patients who come in and think they're retaining urine and indeed it's just overactive bladder and vice versa. So um, we do some simple studies in the office, just a quick bladder ultrasound to start with if we think you're in retention to rule that out or in, um, and then go from there. I don't always do a, a full workup when you first present, but a post-void residual, if I'm suspicious or not sure which one you may have, is an easy office test, just a quick bladder ultrasound. Um, fecal incontinence is involuntary loss of stool. Um, and again, it's something that's embarrassing, just like the urinary problems, but less talked about. So normally your bladder should store urine. It should be able to hold it. It's a storage device. Um, it fills throughout the day continuously. So everyone thinks they're not emptying, but in reality, they're emptying and the bladder is filling or they may not be emptying. But um, I can sit and do a cystoscopy and watch the urine drain down the tubes into the bladder. And it does not take long. It takes about 30 seconds to a minute, depending on how hydrated you are, for me to see the efflux of urine coming into the bladder. So it's constantly filling, but it should be able to hold. It's a storage vessel, right? Um, so again, the rate of filling will be, depend on the fluid. That's why people limit their fluid. And that's actually counterintuitive to treating overactive bladder and not good for your kidneys. But the nerves that allow the bladder to fill should be able to signal the bladder not to contract when it's got low volume. So again, that's the capacity of your bladder um, should be able to hold 300 cc's without you needing to rush to the bathroom. Um, when it's time to urinate, those nerve signals then say bladder contract and let the urine out. And then the sphincter that holds the urine in, which includes the pelvic floor muscles, has to relax to let the contractions of the bladder release the urine. And then there is this picture leaves out this whole neuro connection between the bladder and the brain and the signals to the brain have to control the bladder also. So it's, it's complex as far as the nerve signals. Um, and, and it leads to the bladder either holding properly or not, or the sphincter releasing properly or not. Um, so I, people worry that if we give them an overactive bladder medicine, it'll be co uh, counteracting their diuretic. I tell them the diuretic is to get rid of the excess fluid, but the treatments for overactive bladder are allow you to hold the urine that's created uh, until it's time to get to the bathroom. So again, overactive bladder is the frequent and urgent need to empty your bladder um, and often can be so urgent that you cannot hold it and you end up in, with incontinence. You either have frequency um, defined as eight or more times in a day, urgency where you're sitting there going, I didn't know I have to go and all of a sudden you have to go. Um, urge incontinence is where you had that urge but didn't make it. And then nocturia is waking up more than twice a night. Um, so we consider waking up once a night, especially if you drink a lot of fluid around bedtime, normal, but two or more times a night, we consider nocturia. 
So with overactive bladder, uh, it can be an abnormal communication between the brain, brain and the bladder, uh, which can lead to the urgency, um, an unwanted bladder contraction. We can actually measure that on a study called urodynamics. As we fill the bladder, we can see if it's contracting when it shouldn't. Uh, and then the rush to the restroom or lose urine before you make it to the restroom. Um, and again, that's overactive bladder. That's different than stress incontinence. Stress incontinence um, is, again, different from urge incontinence and overactive bladder in that stress incontinence is the sphincter is not holding properly. So you cough, sneeze, laugh, jump, try to jump on a trampoline, try to run. Um, do some heavy weightlifting or even light weightlifting. Um, that, if you leak with that, that's stress incontinence and it's very different than the urge incontinence. And you can have both. And that's important for us to tease out which one you have um, so that we're treating the right problem. Um, and again, it's very common here to have the mixed incontinence um, or just one or the other. Um, and you can have a reactive bladder without leaking and we still can treat it again. That's when it's more than eight times a day or the nocturia. So normal bowel function is somewhat similar to the bladder. The stool enters the rectum, nerve signals are sent to your brain. You should be able to hold that. It, it does require a sphincter around the, the rectum, which are the pelvic floor muscles also um, to relax, to let the stool come out when the contraction is um, signaled, and if that pathway is not intact or the muscles are not strong enough, you can get bowel incontinence. Um, so that was what fecal incontinence is. It could be with liquid, solid, or mucousy stool. Uh, it could include a southern ur urge to go and not making it. It can just leak out or soil, um, and that's the passive when you don't even know there's an urge and it's just coming out. So again, we talked about it. It's a quality of life issue that is very important and, and treatable and you don't have to limit your activities. Um, it, again, physical limitations, reduce social interactions, um, feeling guilty or depressed because you're leaking all the time. You can't go to family events because you're afraid of making a mess. Um, and the reality is some people don't understand that it's beyond your control. It's not something you're doing or not doing. The bladder overtakes. You saw the commercials with the bladder leading the person down, down the road. Um, it is truly that where the brain can no longer stop that signal and the bladder is, is contracting when it shouldn't. And you can do everything right and it can still happen. Um, so there is a psychological component to having this problem. Some may limit sexual activity from either overactive bladder or um, stress incontinence. Um, having to go every 20 minutes, does, your boss doesn't look kindly on that. So it can cause decreased productivity, absence from work, or, or feeling like you're being judged because you're always going to the bathroom. And again, knowing that, that it's not your fault and people don't understand that. Uh, there is a cost to all of the diapers and pads and precautions that you have to use, um, an actual monetary cost besides just quality of life too. It's actually one of the biggest complaints I get is the cost of pads and diapers and bed protectors because they're expensive. Um, so it's not a normal part of getting older. Uh, I have patients of all ages and I try to say it's not just because you're getting older. I have 20 year olds in, I have people in my age group, 40s, um, coming in saying, well, now I'm old. I'm like, no, because that would put me in that category. It, it's not just that. And um, so we don't want you to think that it's normal and just put up with it. It's not just part of being a woman. We have a lot of males with overactive bladder as well as the retention problem. Um, so. Uh, it, you know, you see the woman in the picture here, but uh, I always think all of our brochures and information should have both if it applies to both. Uh, it's not just an issue with the prostate for men. Um, there's a very simple study we can do in the office that's non-invasive to tell me, do I think it's a pro 
prostate problem or is it an overactive bladder problem, especially if there's no flow issues and it's more the frequency and urgency. And uh, often it's not caused by something you did, although there are some modifiable factors that can help overactive bladder. Um, the good news is there are treatments to help us regain control of bladder and bowel. Um, so step one, get an appointment with someone who knows what they're doing with this. Um, there are, your, your primary care doctor sometimes can help, but um, often they don't have the simple tools to figure out, is it an emptying problem or overactive bladder, um, stress incontinent, but some of them are very comfortable doing it. So it's nice to bring it up with your primary so they can decide if you should have a referral um, or if you're not getting anywhere with your primary care or just want to be assess properly at the start, you can go to a urologist or a urogynecologist and some general gynecologists treat that as well. Um, a baseline diary is always good. It seems like when I ask like, well, how often is it every two hours? When do you leak? People are like, oh, or what are the triggers? They haven't really delved into that, um, which is fine. We can start thinking about it and offer you some of the things to guide your thought process to help us figure out what's going on. But a diary is always good. Just a couple days is all you need. Um, tests for diagnoses, I do not jump into invasive tests right away. A lot of times we don't need them. A lot of times just by your history and physical exam, I can figure out what we should start with. And then we can go from there if we're not getting anywhere or we're having side effects. Um, or it's not working, basically, then I start to do some other tests. Um, so you, everybody's worried that we're going to do some invasive program, probing when you come into the office, and uh, that is not the case. Um, we do not jump right to that. Most people leave feeling relieved that it was either a, definitely a simple exam, but um, and some advice, and then possibly some trials of different things but not straight off invasive tests when you, when you come to see us. Um, and then we give some treatment options. So uh, initially bladder retraining, um, lifestyle changes, overactive bladder is driven by some dietary um, factors like too much caffeine, alcohol, spicy foods and drinks, not enough water. Again, counterintuitive, everybody wants to limit their water uh, when actually the more, um, dilute the urine is, the better the bladder can hold it. If it's really yellow and concentrated, the bladder wants to get rid of it. So limiting fluid is not a good idea. Um, prescription medications definitely can cause it, but we can't always stop those. I have people who don't take their diuretics as their cardiologist wants them to do, um, saying they have to go to the bathroom too much or they don't take it when they go out. And um, we've got to figure out a plan. I typically don't stop those medications, but try to work within the realm of what is right with your other medical conditions. Uh, if we're not getting any better, you've got to come back. And I always put a, a couple week follow up or a few months follow up, depending on what we decide, because I want to know that you're better. And patients who come to me two years later, and I said, I said, come back. And they say, I know I got busy. I got, I had to take care of my loved ones. So again, the life factors get in the way. We're never mad that you didn't come back. We're always happy that you came back, especially if something is not working because we do want to keep going until we can figure out what works for you. And then um, there's medications um, under the initial treatment. We might use some medications for overactive bladder or fecal incontinence. Um, but, uh, we don't always have to use medications right off the bat. And then if things aren't working, that's when I probably will do a few studies on the bladder to figure out why. Uh, and then we can talk about advanced therapies and again, for specifically for overactive bladder and urgent continence, there's sacral neuromodulation, there's percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation and chemo deinnervation injections. So we'll go through each of those a little bit. Um, fecal incontinence is the same type of thing. We often do pelvic floor therapy first to try to strengthen those muscles. Um, and for the advanced therapies, there's sacroneuromodulation, 
um, transanal irrigation or sphincter repair, which is more invasive. So the initial treatment for overactive bladder, we kind of went through this on that other slide. Uh, bladder retraining, pelvic floor physical therapy, timed voiding, delaying your urination by 15 minute increments, pelvic floor exercise and biofeedback. But I'm gonna tell you, you're not a failure if these don't work. The bladder muscle is very strong and you can use all kinds of techniques. And if it decides it's going to contract and it's, again, when you watch a urodynamics, it's flat. And when it decides to contract for some people, that contraction is off the charts. Uh, and there's no way your sphincter is going to stop it. Your mind's going to stop it. So it's a nerve to muscle issue. Um, and we can do these things and they work for some people, but when they're not working, it's, it's not because you're not trying hard enough. Uh, we talked about lifestyle changes, uh, carbonated beverages, caffeine, alcohol, spicy foods and drinks. Don't drink too much before bedtime. Um, and then medications, we have... Uh, beta ad agonists, and then anticholinergics. Uh, these are uh, anticholinergics have some that are very older drugs that have a lot of side effects. We have newer anticholinergics and then the beta agonists, which have less side effects. So um, we talk about pros and cons and side effects of each medication before we start them and then decide which one might be right for you to try to calm the bladder down and let you hold. For advanced therapies, we have percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. That's where we put a small electrode needle um, in the ankle. It doesn't hurt, it's a tiny acupuncture needle. And then stimulate the nerve for 30 minutes. Um, you just sit in the office and read a book or just, uh, look at your phone, whatever. Uh, it's 12 weeks, so it uh, requires some commitment and time. Uh, it usually takes about six weeks to work. And then um, if it's improved after 12 weeks, it requires some maintenance. So it is a little bit time consuming, but it's non-invasive. And so it is uh, a treatment that we offer. Chemo, excuse me, chemo de-innervation, which is Botox in the bladder. Everyone's like, Botox in the bladder. Uh, yes, we do that. It works fairly well. We usually um, have to do it every six months. If it's working, we don't do it on a schedule. I usually wait till symptoms wear off, but if it's working, um, it's designed to last at least six months and sometimes longer. We inject at a 10 minute procedure into the wall of the bladder to relax that muscle. And then there's sacroneuromodulation therapy or otherwise known as SNM, not to be confused with SNM. So if it sounds the same, I'm talking about sacral neuromodulation. Uh, it controls the nerves that control that contraction to the bladder or bowel to calm them down. Um, the nice thing is we test it with a non-invasive procedure. It, it takes about 15 minutes to put the little lead in and then you carry an external pap and we can try it for five days. And if it works, then we will implant the device that you seem to prefer and I'll go over the different options there. And it can work for up to five to 15 years. And actually um, the beauty of the axonics therapy is they keep doing testing and engineering to make the batteries and leads last longer. Um, and so uh, for long-term therapy without repeated treatments, uh, sacral neuromodulation is, is a good option. So that brings us to the axonics therapy, which is um, for overactive bladder and urge incontinence is um, the sacral neuromodulation. Uh, it has a guideline recommended therapy. So in both the urologic and uh, SUFU, which is the female urologic and urogyne um, um, committees, they're all, it's a guideline that's recommended to restore normal control of the bladder and bowel. Um, it's indicated um, with FDA approval for overactive bladder, urinary retention, and fecal incontinence. And again, we talked about the nerves, the brain, the bladder muscle, and the contraction, and the rectum, um, and the muscles, and the contraction there. And it basically stimulates the nerve to help restore normal communication between all of that complicated network to calm both the bladder and back 
uh, bowel down and also sometimes to help the bladder empty better. Um, so the first steps towards long-term therapy is the test. So again, I do, for my practice, I do a five-day test um, and uh, you walk around with this little controller and this is taped to your back. And then there's a lead, which is a tiny little wire going into the nerve to stimulate it. Um, and the only downside is you can't shower during that test period, but you could sponge bath and do most of your regular activities. We don't want you exercising or anything so that the lead doesn't pull out. We keep bladder diaries and then you come back and say, this is life-changing or it didn't do anything. So if it works and you're happy, then we can implant the device. And if not, we just remove the lead in the office um, and figure out what else might work for you. Uh, it's an easy controlled remote for the test and for the um, actual device. Um, and then if it works during the test, we have two different options. And that's the nice thing about the Axonics. They have a rechargeable device. Um, it can last up to 15 years. In the past, the batteries would wear out within a few years, depending on how much stimulation they have to provide. Um, but this you can charge for a month. Uh, for less than an hour and you just it's external you don't plug yourself in uh, it's just this little pad you put on your back and sit there for an hour or so um, it's small so I I have a lot of patients who like that they can't really feel it much under the skin um, it's quite small they'll show it in the next slide and then there's a recharge free system and the beauty is again I like the axonic system in that their engineers are working to make it better and last longer um, so that we're not having to redo the battery um, 10 to 20 years um, and small thin design it's also getting smaller and smaller um, which is nice because uh, even with the old device even if you could feel it it wasn't uncomfortable but it was there and the smaller device, um, you can feel it under the skin a little bit, but it's not uncomfortable. Um, the controlling systems are the same. And again, this one has the charger and this one doesn't have to be recharged. So the rechargeable, tiny, that's a quarter and that's the device. Uh, minimally invasive outpatient procedure. It takes about 40 minutes to implant everything. Um, we use a light anesthesia, um, and again, it's designed to last at least 15 years. Again, they're pushing this further and further with the, um, the experiments and the engineers kit working on making a better device at all the time. Uh, also, the devices are MRI compatible. They used to not be, but they are now, which is important. Uh, a lot of Patients who have spine issues, which can affect the nerves to the bladder, need MRIs. Uh, Parkinson's patients, there's all kinds of people with nerve issues that also affect the bladder and would need routine MRIs. So this allows you to have it done. Um, easy remote control, not a complicated device. And the other thing that this slide or any of my slides say, the Axonics um, representatives are amazing with their patient interactions and talk you through everything and are available always to help you figure out and troubleshoot. Um, your physician should also be available to help you troubleshoot. Um, but uh, it's nice when you've tried a few things with the representatives and then come back and we can see how they're working. Um, so I do like the support that Exonix gives their patients. Um, again, the charging system, we talked about that. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, efficacy, very important. Uh, first charging is easy. Uh, after two years of therapy, everyone thought it was acceptable and not that hard, but did it work? Uh, sorry, this is the charging. Clinically significant improvements, 93% of patients at two years. Not that they've improved after two years, but they get improvement and it's lasting at least two years. And most patients who have an implanted device uh, don't have to adjust it very often. Once it's working, um, they can just leave it alone. And, and that's the way it's designed to work. Over two years, uh, nine, over 90% of patients were satisfied. 
um, and that 93% would undergo the treatment again with the expected results. Um, this is this slide gets me because it's just so fantastic to live a normal life, meaning, you know, you think of it as a nuisance or not that bad, you can deal with it. But when you no longer have that problem and you're no longer leading your life around your bladder and bowel schedule or unscheduled leakage problems, uh, it, it's, it's amazing uh, to see patients feeling so much better and doing the activities that they have been wanting to do and had to limit. Um, and the implant procedure is, is very straightforward. Um, so that's sacral neuromodulation. If you have questions, please send that over to Allie so she can get that to me. Um, and now we're going to shift gears to the stress urinary incontinence. And that is leakage when you sneeze, exercise, laugh, cough, walk. Sometimes when you just stand up and the pressure is there, um, that's stress incontinence and that's related to the sphincter. So we talked about storage of urine and the overactive bladder. The bladder has to hold and then react. Uh, to hold, it has to relax and the urethra muscles contract to hold the urine in. When it's time to urinate, that muscle has to relax and the bladder contracts but sometimes the urethra is too relaxed um, and there's some different factors causing that. And that's the same with bowel incontinence as well. We'll have a slide on that, but it's the same issue. The pelvic floor muscles have to hold during storage and relax only when it's time to empty. Um, so physical activity increases abdominal pressure and that can cause the leakage if the urethra does not coap tight or close properly meaning the muscles around there, which form the sphincter, are not strong enough. Um, if they're weakened, leak, either with cough, sneeze, laugh, this pretty much going over the same things. We'll skip a few things. I already told you it's a major problem for a lot of people, um, so you're not alone. One in three women um, and males can have the problem too. Uh, so, you know, and everybody jokes and laughs about it. Oh, I peed my pants when I was playing tennis, uh, but we can help you with that. 60% um, of women say the symptoms impact their lifestyle. Same type of thing as overactive bladder and then the economic um, cost of pads. Um, so it's a similar issue with both stress and urgent continence. There's treatment options. Uh, pelvic floor exercises are where we start. You can try kegels on your own. When they don't seem to be working, we do have specialized physical therapists and everyone's like, what are they gonna do? I do my kegels. Um, they are very helpful. I like, I say it's like having a personal trainer. Uh, I could be working out on my, uh, whatever I'm working out on at the time. Uh, I think I'm doing a good job. And then if I go to an exercise class and have a trainer who's, uh, they're holding me accountable. The results are better and quicker. Um, I don't have time for any of that, but <laughs> uh, if it, it, it does help. And if you make the time, often you get the results, especially for mild stress incontinence. Um, and then there's procedures we can do. There's urethral bulking agents, which are minimally invasive procedures. And then there's a surgical sling, which is a little more invasive. So we'll go through that. Um, it, it is an individualized treatment. I had patients who come to me and said, I tried, I tried, I tried. And again, it's not because they're failing. It's because that muscle just is not going to get strong enough. Um, and then we start talking about different options. And often they'll say, which one do you want me to do? And I'm like, no, no, let me go over pros and cons again, because it's not my decision. And then we go over the pros and cons of each again to help them narrow it down. Um, so lifestyle changes, pelvic floor exercises with or without a physical therapist. This is all for stress incontinence now. We're talking about a difference than the urge incontinence, although pelvic floor therapy can help with that. There's a surgery we can do. It's a 30 minute procedure outpatient under general anesthesia or a spinal. Um, it says here mesh, but we do have other types of slings. We do use mesh a lot. 
but it's a small piece of mesh. Um, and then there is a um, fascial sling we can do if you don't want mesh. It's the gold standard, uh, 80 to 90% success with 17 year follow-up. Um, there are some risks of each procedure, whether non-mesh or mesh, and the downtime is about four weeks. Um, and if you are planning on becoming pregnant or weight, a big weight loss or any major change in body habitus, we usually say hold off on the sling. Um, and then there's your urethral bulking agents. For a long while, we didn't really offer them at the first treatment option because they didn't work very well. Um, I won't name the types we had before, but they often, they wouldn't stay in place. They wouldn't provide lasting results in the area of the urethra. And so they just didn't work quite as well. And so it was kind of like doing something that wasn't gonna work anyway. So we stopped offering it. Um, we would do it after a sling if we needed a little extra support. Now we have better bulking agents that stay in place and last longer. And so we offer it as a first line treatment option. It's an outpatient procedure. Um, it's 10 minutes. And the beauty is there's no downtime, essentially. Um, back to normal activities, exercising, um, and running around with the kids or grandkids uh, without the downtime of the four weeks for the sling. Uh, and we've got Bulkamed as the um, agent that we're using these days that seems to have a lasting effect, um, minimally invasive. So no mesh, uh, minimally invasive. It's a water-based gel that's called hydrophilic, if you see that word. Um, that's um, the nice thing is when you inject it, it doesn't leak right back out. It stays in place and provides these cushions around the urethra to bulk it up. Here's a video. Bulkamid can help provide the relief you've been longing for. The short, incision-free procedure typically takes less than 10 minutes. Involves three to four small injections of soft, water-based gel into the wall of the urethra to help prevent urine from leaking out of the bladder during day-to-day -day activities. It's safe, quick, and most patients can get back to your normal activities almost immediately. 10 minute procedure where we inject into the urethra with some numbing medicine um, and sometimes some nitrous or general, uh, quick general anesthesia or uh, monitored anesthesia, depending on your um, preference. We bulk up the urethra, Make sure you can urinate before you go home. And the next day you're back to normal activities. Safe and effective, 92% of people who had the procedure reported being cured or improved. Simple, um, occasionally we redo the procedure if you get some results, but not thoroughly, but that's not the norm. And long lasting relief, we have data out to seven years. A lot of that is from Europe where they require you to have um, a bulking agent before a sling just because of their health care. So the data is longer in Europe, um, but um, it's been in the United States for over two years now. Um, again, it's not right for everybody. If you're leaking eight pads a day, we need to figure out what's going on, manage some overactive bladder and urge incontinence if we need to, and then consider bulk med versus sling. But that's why you need to talk to somebody who does all of the treatments so that they can help guide you to what's gonna work and be right for you. Uh, we don't wanna implant a inner stem or sacral neuromodulation device for stress incontinence. We don't wanna implant that if you um, don't want that and wanted a medication, you should always be offered all of the treatment options that apply to you um, and not just be offered one treatment. Um, if that's not quite what, what's right for you. I like choices. Um, and so it's nice to go to a provider who, who has all of the tools that um, may help you. Um, ready for symptom relief. So getting started, you can schedule a consultation um, and determine if axonics therapies, either the bulk med or the sacral neuromodulation is right for you or just figure out if you need some pelvic floor physical therapy. So uh, we start from scratch. We don't 
figure out what's right for you based on what was right for your friend. I get a lot of that. This worked for my friend and I get it. You want a quick fix. Like, let's take a step back and figure out what exactly is your problem. And then we'll help guide you. And maybe your friend's thing will work for you too, or we'll find something simple that's right. Um, and then if any of the axonics therapies are right for you, you need to find a provider that offers those and uh, um, we can help you find that as well. So there is an, another QR code or you can go to the website and Ali's gonna take over from here. I really appreciate everybody joining in and thank you for your time. Hopefully it was beneficial. It's hard when I can't answer direct questions during the thing, but please make an appointment uh, if you have further questions or wanna be evaluated. Don't worry, Dr. Mazzani, you're about to be able to answer some questions. Okay. <laughs> but thank you. It was a pleasure hearing from you and your experience with treating patients suffering from these conditions. Dr. Mazzani, what is your opinion of Gemtessa? I have great relief, but the price eliminates it for my regular use. So that is a good question. Um, that I, I like Gemtessa. It's one of the newer agents with less side effects than some of the older agents, less constipation, dry mouth. We don't have any data showing cognitive issues. It is an issue because it's a newer drug and that's up to the insurance companies. Um, the good news is they get approval from more insurance companies as we go along. Again, Gemtessa is not right for everybody, but if it worked for you and you're having trouble getting it approved, um, they have a website um, that you can go to and see if they can offer you some assistance, especially Medicare patients for drug coverage. And that's for any medication and Medicare patients, there are drug programs. So it does take some little bit of work to figure out if we can get it covered. Um, it does start with you calling your insurance company and or going to the company's web website for any kind of assistance. Um, or we may need to switch you to something else if it if it's not covered. But I agree. I hate when patients are like, well, I paid $300. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. $300 a month for a medication. Let's try something else. And if they're not working and it's not covered, let's try potentially one of these alternatives where you don't have to take a medicine every day. That kind of leads into my next question. If you're on a medicine and it works, do you have to stay on it for the rest of your life for it to continue working? I have some patients who after a period of time, they've retrained their bladder and can trial off of it. But I would say 95% of patients, when they go off, they're fine for a month to three months. And they're like, I don't know what happened. I was good. And then I'm like, are you still on the medication? It's designed to be long-term therapy, why, which is why some of the axonics or other treatment options, advanced treatment options are not just when you're failing medications, they're uh, also for when you don't wanna take a medication every day lifelong. But yes, the medication is, is probably gonna be lifelong if it's working. And sometimes we have to switch it up when it stops working. And does the procedure work if you also have constipation a lot? So no, it is not indicated for constipation. Um, unlike the urinary retention for bladder where the SNM um, may work for uh, constipation, it is not indicated. Um, but we can help you with that. You definitely have to work on that. That's a big contributing factor. I meant to say that because it's not on the slide. On um, behavioral modifications is we've got to get the constipation under control for both urge and uh, overactive bladder. And can OAB come and go? I ask because sometimes you have the urge and can hold it for 30 plus and other times you have to go and cannot hold it. And it surprises at the amount of urine released. So yes, you could, it, sometimes it's dietary. When you do a bladder diary and realize, oh, that happened because I had three cups of coffee that day uh, or haven't had a bowel movement in a week. Um, or had zero water this day. So those are some of the triggers. Um, but yes, and some of it can be situational. I have patients like, I'm fine at home. It's when I go out. Others are like, it's fine when I'm out because my mind is busy. But when I'm at home, I'm going every 15 minutes. 
So yes, definitely can be situational. Can axonics be used for both urinary and fecal incontinence when implanted? Yes, yes, for either or both, but not for stress incontinence. Um, I see one question here I wanna make sure we get to, is Volcamed for men? Uh, sorry to skip ahead, but I just wanna make sure we address that. It is not indicated for men. Um, men do have stress urinary incontinence, uh, but the specific Volcamed um, procedure from axonics is not indicated for men. Thank you. <laughs> I, tried, I was gonna send that answer anonymously. <laughs> is it possible that OAB and urinary incontinence are caused by mild bacterial infection? So mild bacteria uh, is an interesting term. You can have bacteria in the urine and have overactive bladder, uh, and it's not, they're not related. A lot of people have some bacteria in the urine, and we don't consider it symptomatic, especially if the antibiotic doesn't help it. Um, so that's why you need a urologist. If your primary care keeps giving you antibiotics uh, for overactive bladder that never gets better with the antibiotics because they think you have a UTI, you just need to see the urologist. And the cultures are very important so we can see what bacteria is growing. And if it's low count and chronic and you never get better and you're still having overactive bladder, we need to address the overactive bladder. Thank you. And is there an age limit? Um, no, so I pra my practice in our adult practice with Georgia Urology starts at 18 um, and there's no upper age limit. And then we have pediatric urologists who can um, guide the pediatric population. But uh, we go by performance status. So uh, that's it's, I never cut anyone off by age. And no matter what, if you can't walk, hear, or see, but are bothered by your leakage, you should come in and we can figure out something or at least try some things to try and help. And where is this procedure usually done? Depends on which procedure. Um, some are in the procedure center, which is more like an office center without anesthesia. Um, sometimes we do things under local plus or minus nitrous. And sometimes we do it as an outpatient surgery center where we have a certified anesthesiologist to either make you sleepy or all the way to sleep. Sometimes we do it at the hospital. Um, especially if you have a lot of uh, comorbidities or multiple medical problems, if we're going to give any type of anesthesia, we do it at the hospital. So we tailor it for you. And is this procedure covered by insurance? Uh, yes. The, yes, the majority of times it is. And unlike all of the medications, which are not all covered, um, I, most of the insurance companies cover the procedure. Um, with the percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, that one in the ankle, uh, unfortunately, Medicare stops covering it after two years, which is a problem because there is some maintenance therapy there. And if they decide you've reached your two years, then you got to figure out something else. We have kind of a long one, but I'll kind of just brief it. Um, have slings have improved over the years? Or are they still the same? I think you might can see that one too. Um, so it depends on how many years we're talking about. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> I don't know how old you are, uh, but uh, there are nuances to sling, especially mesh slings. Um, I have the one brand that I like to use. It's not really the brand specifically because um, all of them now are about the same material. It's more of the person putting it in and the health of the tissues that we're putting it in and using the right candidates. So that's an individual conversation. We do have non-mesh slings and then we have Volcamid as an option. So in general, they've improved over the last 40 years, <laughs> 30 years, uh, I, but I would need to know your specific questions on the time frame of how long that <laughs> is. Mesh is still mesh, and if it's not put in properly, it'll cause problems. And if your tissues aren't healthy, it can cause problems. And what does recovery look like for this procedure? 
Oh, so for the S and M, I did not go over that. For the um, neuromodulation, again, the five-day test, but after we implant the device, I like about three weeks of limited activity while you heal up. Um, and again, that's mainly strenuous exercise or bending, stooping, heavy lifting for the implant for the sacral neuromodulator. Volcomed, we talked about not much downtime at all. Can you still have children after having Volcomed? Yes, yes, you can. It's, it won't interfere in any way, which is nice. And then that brings us to the end of this evening's webinar. If you have any questions or would like to schedule an appointment, we have several ways to help you do so. You can scan the QR code. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of doing a QR code, it's the easiest way to schedule an appointment. Here's how it works. On your compatible Android phone or tablet, open the built-in camera app, point the camera at the QR code on your screen, tap the banner that appears on your phone or tablet, and you will be directed to our scheduling window. Here you will be asked the reason for your visit to which you will type webinar slash mailer for access to appointments with Dr. Mazzani. You can also visit the Georgia Urology website at www.gaurology.com and click on the orange schedule button. When prompted for the reason for your visit, again, please type in the word webinar slash mailer, or you can call the office at 404 292-3727. And when you speak to an operator, make sure that you mention attending this webinar event and they will make sure to get you scheduled promptly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazzani, for your time. We really appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you to all the participants. I appreciate your time too. Thanks, Allie. Thank you. Bye-bye.